Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's great to be back in Chicago. Um, the backdrop to what I want to talk about today is a sense that we all have that the political landscape in the US today is more divided. There are deeper divisions, more hostility. It feels like than any time in recent memory. And that changes in media technology, the rise of the internet, echo chambers, social media, fake news on social media, all in the popular discussion, and, and I think intuitively to many of us feel like potentially a big part of why that is the case. Um, and so what I want to do today is not I'm not going to provide answers to exactly what is happening, what are its causes, and especially, I don't really have any answers to what should we do about it. Um, but I want to just kind of set the stage, at least with some facts, to try to at least get straight what it is that is happening, what do we know about what's happening. And I'll break that into sort of three parts. First, just before talking about media, what do we know about polarization? And is it correct that polarization is higher today than it's ever been in the past? Second, what do we know about the role of the internet in driving that? Can we say anything about to what extent it looks like digital media plays a key role? And third, kind of briefly at the end, I'll talk about a little bit of work we did after the 2016 election to look at the role of fake news specifically, that is clear, unambiguously false stories that were circulated on Facebook. Okay. And so I'll, I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions, but this is Chicago. If anybody has questions as we go along and you know, wants to interrupt me, that's fine too. Um, okay, so what do we know about trends in polarization over time? I think to, to sort of, there's a big literature on this in political science and elsewhere, and to sort of wrap your head around that literature, you want to think about it in two parts. There's a literature on what's happening to polarization of politicians in Washington, and there's a separate literature on what's happening to polarization of all of the rest of us, ordinary people, voters. Um, and on, on the politician side, the sort of conventional wisdom and standard fact is indeed polarization has been going up over time pretty steadily since about 1950, but also that it used to be very high in the past. So if you go back to the early 20th century, late 19th century, Congress was also polarized. So what we've seen is something like a return to that historically polarized kind of period in Congress. Um, this, is, this is sort of the standard measure of that. And so the way this measure is constructed is based on roll call votes in Congress. So without going into the details, roughly speaking, we're going to look at all the data on how people vote, use that to place each congressperson in some ideological space, such that people who are close to each other tend to vote together, people who are far apart tend to vote very differently. And then we'll look at the difference between the average Republican and the average Democrat in that space. So the way you want to think about that is basically polarization will be low if Democrats and Republicans are voting together a lot of the time and crossing party lines. And polarization will tend to be high if they are voting in party, along party lines almost all the time. So this shows that measure for the House and the Senate. And you can see this upward trend since about 1950 and high levels um, almost as high levels of polarization in Congress in the past. Um, so that's one fact. Second, we've done some recent work looking at a different dimension of polarization and difference in Congress, which is partisan language. So it's clear to anybody paying attention today that Democrats and Republicans people on opposite sides are using language in systematically different ways and deliberately different ways. Uh, talk about radical Islamic terrorism, illegal aliens or undocumented workers, death taxes and estate taxes, so on and so forth. Um, and so the question that we wanted to ask is, if you looked at language and asked a similar question, how different is the language that a typical Democrat uses and a typical Republican uses? would you see a similar picture to this? So I'm not going to tell you 
all of the details of how we do this. I'll give you a sense, but this is the picture that you end up with if you look at language, which is pretty different. That is, in terms of how we speak or how politicians speak in Congress, there really is something unprecedented about the current period. Um, and this stays high. We've now extended this forward to 2016. So it stays high in recent years. So what does this graph show you? Um, the, the way we did this is, so one, we have the full text of all of the speeches that were delivered on the floor of Congress over this period back to 1870. And the way we conceptualize what does partisanship of language mean is you think about, imagine that you're listening to somebody talk and you don't know their party. How well could you guess their party based on which words they choose to use? So imagine each year you get to see a fixed amount of speech, like a minute of speech in 1870, in 1950, in 1990, today. How well could you guess their party from their speech? To, to, to measure that, we train a machine learning algorithm on the text data. So the goal of that machine learning algorithm is, given the words that somebody uses, predict their party. And we look at the predictive power of that algorithm. So what this graph shows is basically how well can you predict your party. The numbers on the y-axis here are, are, are a little bit hard to parse because the, the measure is how, what is the chance you could predict somebody's partly co party correctly if you heard them say one phrase? So you can't predict very well based on one phrase. You see the dramatic change. If you aggregate that up to something like a minute of speech, it implies you know, as recently as 1980, the chance you could guess somebody's party was something like 55%. And now it's something like 80% to get a sense of the magnitude. Um, okay, so those are a couple of facts about Congress. I think putting together what we know about Congress, the conventional wisdom is right. There is a dramatic increase in polarization, and, and especially in language. We, we talk about in the paper why this changed so dramatically when it did. That election where it spikes up is the 1994 takeover of Congress by Republicans under Newt Gingrich, which we think not coincidentally was a, an election that was famous for being all about language. That was the election where this guy called Frank Luntz, who's a Republican pollster who was sort of famous for uh, using focus groups to figure out which phrases are most effective in political rhetoric and sending out memos to all the congressional candidates telling them which words they should use, which phrases to use. He became famous in that election. Okay. So there's a whole story to tell there, but I'm not going to um, have time to go into it more. Happy to talk about it more. Okay. The other side of the coin is what about voters? What about ordinary people? And here the, the literature is actually fairly undecided about what the right answer is. There's a lot of prior work that has essentially argued that the idea that American voters are more polarized, more divided today than they've been in the past is kind of a myth. And that if you look at the data, you don't really see evidence of that. So these are a few kind of famous uh, papers that reached that conclusion. Um, as I'm going to show you, I think the, the correct summary is it depends how you define polarization, or it depends what measure you look at. And so there are some measures that you might think would be good measures of polarization that don't show any changes over time, and there are other measures that show big changes over time. And some of the academic debate here about, is about uh, which of those things is it appropriate to use the term polarization for. I'm going to sort of stay out of that. I'm not, I'm not too concerned about the semantics of it, but I, I think if we think broadly about Polarization is meaning systematic divisions between one side and the other. There are a bunch of different measures you could use, and, and, and they show different kinds of results. So what, is, what are those other papers looking at when they say there is no increase in polarization? The, the biggest one, and I think the one that's been kind of the dominant focus of that literature, at least was for a while, is just let's look at people's views on individual policy issues. So take something like abortion or taxes. You ask people, what, on abortion, what would you say is your preferred policy on some scale where at one end is abortion should be legal all the time under any circumstances. The other end of the spectrum is abortion should be illegal all the time under any circumstances. And look at where people fall on that spectrum. So what, what might you expect 
uh, on a measure like that, polarization would show up as it would look at something like we used to be all kind of clustered in the middle, and over time we've spread out. So there's a group of people on one end and a group of people on the other. Okay? That you don't see. The reality is for almost all policy questions, including abortion, including taxes, Americans in the past were clustered in the middle, and they're still clustered in the middle today. And there's no big move toward people being out on the extremes. That's sort of counterintuitive, I think, because the people who are out on the extremes get a lot of attention. And they're the ones we hear about the most. But I think that's kind of misleading about the distribution of views in the overall public. So, so that might be a kind of optimistic note. Views on individual issues are not becoming more polarized. Other things where you don't see it, if you ask people, would you identify yourself as moderate, conservative, very conservative, liberal, very liberal, you might expect to see polarization as more people in the extreme categories. You don't see that. You could ask people, do you identify as a Republican, a Democrat, an independent? You might expect polarization to show up as more people have strong identifications with the parties. You don't see that. And a final thing that's been discussed a lot is the idea that we may be sorting where we live geographically so that increasingly Republicans live around other Republicans and Democrats live around other Democrats. There was a book called The Big Sort by Bill Bishop which kind of advanced that hypothesis and got a lot of attention when it was written about 10 years ago. Roughly speaking, I would say that the results of that book have been debunked, essentially. Not that, the, not that the facts in the book are not right, but that interpreting the facts in the way they're interpreted is not right. And if you look carefully at residential segregation, most measures don't show any increasing sorting. Okay. So here are a couple, just to give you the sense, this is people's ideological identification, very conservative, very liberal, conservative, liberal, moderate, going back to 1975, and you see that's pretty stable over time. There's no evidence of big increases in the, in the people on the extremes. This is the same thing for parties. Do you identify with the Republicans? Do you identify with the Democrats? Are you somewhere in between? If anything on that, you see more people identifying as independent and fewer people identifying as parties. So that looks sort of like the opposite of polarization. So if you stop there, you might say, great, this whole thing, idea that this is a particularly divided moment in politics is kind of a, a myth and we're actually all one big happy family. Um, that turns out, I think, not to be quite right. So where do you need to look to see evidence in the data of the, of the thing that we feel intuitively, which is that there are a lot of divisions right now? Um, four things where I think the fourth is in some ways the most important. So the first is, although any individual issue, the distribution of views has remained relatively stable, people are clustered in the middle on abortion and taxes, the, the correlation in people's views, both between your views on abortion and your party identification, and between your views on abortion and your views on taxes and your views on other issues, those correlations have all gone up. So what does that mean? It means it used to be more common to have somebody who had conservative views on taxes but identified as a Democrat. Or it used to be more common to have somebody who had conservative views on taxes but more liberal views on abortion. And those kinds of people have become scarcer. The correlation has gone up. So more and more, you either say you're a Republican and you have consistently conservative views, or you say you're a Democrat and you have consistently liberal views. Um, another thing that's gone up is what's called straight ticket voting. If you just look at like what share of people when they go to vote, vote exclusively for Republicans or exclusively for Democrats, that's gone up. And the one I said I think is, I think is in some ways the most important and the one that to me captures what is the, 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 the heart of what we're experiencing right now is if you, if you wanna see evidence of polarization, really the place to see it is any question that gets at how one side feels about the other side. Say, how, how warmly or coldly do you Republicans feel about the Democrats? How warmly or coldly do you Democrats feel about the Republicans? Okay. So here's some, some stuff to kind of catch the flavor of that. And, and this, by the way, this is, a lot of this work is due to 
Shanto Iyengar, who's uh, in the communications department at Stanford and some of his co-authors really pioneered this. So th these facts are gonna come from his work. Um, so these were, this is just survey data from 1960 and 2008 where they asked people both for your own party and for the other party, rate those people on a bunch of characteristics. Like, do you think they're smart? Do you think they're selfish? And you see in 1960, so blue here is what you said about your own party. Red is what you said about the other party. So in 1960, people said, you know, they're, we're both pretty smart. Our party's a little bit smarter, but the other guys are pretty smart too. And they said, I mean, obviously nobody in our party is very selfish, and most people in the other party are not either, but some are. By 2008, that picture has changed a lot. So everybody says the other party are not smart at all, and they are obviously incredibly selfish. Here's another question that kind of captures a different dimension of that. Ask people, would you be upset if your son or daughter married somebody of the other party? So that was something that in 1960, basically nobody said, people sort of said, why, why, that's a weird question. Why are you asking me that? By 2008, 20, 25, 30% of people are saying yes. And this is asked, the context of this question is a series of questions that ask this about a bunch of different things, like would you be upset if your son or daughter married somebody of a different race? Would you be upset if they married somebody of a different religion, from a different country, and so on? And I'm pretty sure that this, for, for opposite party, is higher than the share that would be upset for any of those other kind of characteristics. Here are some other things from, from some recent work that we did. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of these, but these are just plots that pick up some of the other dimensions. So these are other things about feelings. Partisan affect is an index of, if I ask you on a scale of zero to 100, how warmly do you feel toward the other side? Compared to how warmly or coldly do you feel toward people in your own party? How different are those? And that's gone way up. Ideological affect is the same thing, but instead of your party and the other party, your ideology, you liberals versus them conservatives. This is straight ticket voting. And this is an issue consistency score, which is like how correlated are your views across different issues. So those have all gone up. And we, we can kind of aggregate all those things together into a measure um, that I'll show you in some of the work that I'll show you later, uh, which is an index of, of all of the measures that people have pointed out show some increase over time. So you can see those have, that index has gone up steadily, and particularly since 1996. Okay, so I think the, the bottom line on part one is Washington is clearly getting more polarized, steadily and gradually so on voting, quite dramatically so in language. The evidence has been kind of mixed about voters, but I think the picture is becoming increasingly clear that indeed you should describe voters as becoming more polarized too. And that varies a little bit across measures, but the place to see it is these measures of how you feel about the other side. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, how much of that, what we just looked at, is caused by the internet or by digital media? Um, so I don't have a, an answer to that question for you, but I'm gonna show you some facts that I think are informative, helping kind of shape our priors about how important digital media is likely to be. So the first thing that I think is important to get straight is just how important is digital news, and in particular social media, news through social media, as a source of political news and information in this country. And these facts are important in part because I think most people, both most of us in universities and most journalists writing about these issues themselves are very heavy users of digital media and social media. And I think that tends to, they tend to kind of project that sometimes and imagine that that's true of the whole world. So some facts to kind of pin that down. 2013, a few years ago, there was a McKinsey study that estimated that all digital platforms together, desktops, laptops, 
mobile, tablets, social media, stuff in your browser, the New York Times app. All of that together accounted for 8% of total news consumption time in 2013. Now measuring this is hard. I'd put a pretty big standard error around that. It might be 15, but it's not 50. Um, for social media, there's a Pew study in which 18% of Americans said they got news and information from social media often. Another 15% or so said sometimes. In a study that we did, which is this fake news study that I'll tell you about more at the end, 14% of people said social media was their most important source of news in the 2016 election. Um, and these are the results from that survey. So what, what other things are important? Well, so about 14% of people say social media, 14% of people say, or 15% of people say some other kinds of digital media like apps and, and the New York Times website. The majority of people say television. And so television remains the main source of political news and information in this country. And then there's a little bit for print and, and radio. Okay. So that's, I think that's kind of where we are. You know, a, a quarter is not zero. And so these, both social media and digital media more broadly, definitely are big enough to be important, definitely are big enough to have an impact, definitely are big enough that we should be worried about them. But we want to keep in mind that they're not most of the way people get. There's, there was like a, a fact from that same Pew survey I showed you, which was widely repeated in press coverage, and it's kind of constantly repeated in press coverage, which is a majority of Americans now get their political news and information from social media. You might read that and think, well, that's sort of at odds with what I just told you. Where does that come from? Well, that Pew survey asked people, do you get news and information from social media? One, often. Two, sometimes. Three, hardly ever. And four, never. And so to get a majority of Americans, you add up the people who said often, sometimes, and hardly ever. <laughs> and that number is like 55% or, or so. so it is true that a majority of Americans have at some point gotten news and information from social media, but it's only something like 14% for whom it's the most important. Okay, so that's like order of magnitude kind of getting things straight. Now, how might you ask whether social media, digital media is driving polarization? Again, we would love to have some great natural experiment where we can show you that causal parameter exactly and decompose exactly what share of the polarization is due to social media. We don't have that. But something we thought would be informative to kind of get a sense is, is just a really simple question. Take those polarization measures I showed you. Take that index of overall polarization on those nine measures. Compute it separately for a bunch of different groups, demographic groups in the population. And just ask, does it look like the ones who are heavy social media and internet users are the same groups that are getting more polarized? That's not the same thing as cleanly pinning down the causal parameter, but it, it might be kind of important, informative. So what kinds of demographic groups might you want to look at? An example of a demographic group that might be kind of informative is breaking people down by age. There's a, as you would guess, a very strong age gradient in social media use. People who are MBA students use social media a lot. People who are college students use social media a lot. People who are over 75 years old in this country do not use social media a lot. So like to a first approximation, 80 year olds are not on Instagram, <laughs> Facebook at all. Um, okay, so, you know, question if social media is the driver, the key driving force of polarization, you might expect that the polarization would be going up the most for these younger groups and would be going up less for these older groups. So what do you see? You sort of see the opposite of that. You see that actually the groups that have seen the biggest increase in polarization are the oldest Americans. Polarization has increased more for people over 75 than it has for people 18 to 39. It's been going up for everybody. But if, you want, if, if social media is the driving force, you need to have some story for what's going on with these 75-year-olds. And it's not that you cannot tell stories. So it's possible that 
social media polarizes young people and then they talk to older people. There's spillovers like that across groups. It's possible that social media polarizes young people. The media or politicians respond to that and that in turn polarizes older groups. It's possible that the handful of 75 year olds who are on Instagram are incredibly susceptible to that and so they are driving this entire trend. But I think at a kind of Occam's razor first cut look at this data that does not scream social media as a driver. And you might keep in the back of your mind, what, what is consistent with this demographic pattern is cable television. Because cable television is something that older Americans watch quite a lot. So remember I showed you before a chart with four different components, straight ticket voting, effective polarization, and so on. And then I showed you an index of nine of those measures. So what we did to construct this index is just say, we go to the literature, find every measure that somebody in the political science literature has pointed to as evidence of rising polarization, and then construct an index that aggregates all of those. You can also do this separately component by component. So look at straight ticket voting by itself, look at effective hostility between parties or hostility between ideologies and so on. And essentially the picture is the same for all of those measures one by one. Right. So I think, I think eight out of the nine measures, the 75 year olds have gone up more than the younger people. As sort of an aside, this is about polarization. This is not, the, the topic for today is not how did Donald Trump become president? But just if you were wondering, is social media and like cleverly targeted ads placed on Facebook by Cambridge Analytica and other kind of devious actors, Russian robots, various, various things like that on Facebook, is that what elected Donald Trump? You have in some of an even more dramatic fact, and this is a fact that you already knew, that it is not young people who elected Donald Trump. It's older people who elected Donald Trump. And people over 75 really like Donald Trump. So this is just a trend in Republican vote share across demographics. And you see that's gone up a lot for older people too. Okay. So I think that's some evidence that pushes, there's a, that is in tension with the view that social media is the main driving force. Second thing you could think about is, well, it's, it's not just out of nowhere that we have the idea that social media and the internet might be important. There's a specific theory for why it might be important, which is, as Cass Sunstein and Eli Pariser and a bunch of other people have argued, the internet makes available a much wider array of viewpoints. People like to get news and information that's consistent with their own views. Therefore, there's the possibility that the internet makes it easier for people to only get news that's consistent with the views that they started out with, and we all end up in little echo chambers where the conservatives only hear conservative news, the liberals only hear liberal news, neo-Nazis only hear neo-Nazi news, and so on. Um, so there too, we can just do some kind of first order cross-checking that hypothesis against the data. Um, and here, a caveat is, I know the answer to this question circa about seven years ago. And then I have some hints in how the answer might have changed since then. So let me show you what the picture looked like seven years ago and then we'll talk about how it might have changed. Um, so in, in an earlier paper that I did with another Booth alum, Jesse Shapiro, um, we looked at the question just descriptively how ideologically segregated is online news consumption. That is, to what extent is it true that conservatives and liberals see different stuff? And we take the approach in this paper of measuring that the same way that we measure residential segregation when we study residential segregation of cities. So the idea is think of each website as like a neighborhood. See to what extent are the neighborhoods that the conservatives are in mostly conservative? To what extent are the neighborhoods that the liberals are in mostly liberal? And then we can ask that question for the internet. We can ask that question for traditional media, television, print newspapers, and we can also ask that question for people's face-to-face -face interactions. So is the neighborhood you live in online more diverse ideologically than your family, your workplace, the people you talk about politics with face-to-face? -face? Um, and to show you these results, I need to define just a few things. So three steps. Step one, for any given outlet, like 
foxnews.com, define the share conservative on that outlet to be the share of people who visit it that are either conservatives or liberals who are conservative. Right? The share of the visitors who are conservative. Then for each individual, define their conservative exposure to be the average of that across the websites that they visit. Right? So, so there's a share conservative for each outlet. There's a conservative exposure for each person. That's like the average composition of my neighborhood online. And then finally, there's something called the isolation index, which is a standard measure of racial segregation or, or residential segregation in general, which is just the difference between that number for conservatives and liberals. The difference in the neighborhood that the average conservative is in or the neighborhood that the average liberal is in. So in the residential segregation context, that corresponds to asking how different is the share white in the average white person's neighborhood from the share white in the average black person's neighborhood. And this is the analog of that um, for media. So to give you an example, imagine there are just two outlets in the world, New York Times and Fox News, 12 conservatives, 12 liberals. Each person's going to go to just one site to make it simple. Three cases you could imagine. At one extreme, all the conservatives go to Fox News, all the liberals go to New York Times. In that case, the conservatives, so share conservative here is one and zero. The conservatives' exposure, therefore, is one, and the liberals' exposure is zero. And the difference between those two things, the isolation index, is one. That's like maximal segregation. The opposite extreme would be they're, they're equally divided. Then both of them have conservative exposure of 0.5 and the isolation index is zero. Somewhere in between, you might have like two thirds conservative on Fox, one third conservative on New York Times. You're gonna get some number in between zero and one, in this case, one ninth. So this isolation index has scale that ranges from zero, no segregation to one, perfect segregation. So if you do this now for the whole internet, circa the time this 2011 paper was written, use data from Comscore that records every website that people visit, take all of the news, political news and information websites in the data, and compute this measure, what do you see? And you see that the internet looks like this. So I'm gonna show you some pictures that look like this, and the way to read them is, the x-axis here is the isolation index. The top dot is the conservative exposure of conservatives, and the bottom dot is the conservative exposure of liberals. The number on the x-axis is the difference between those two things. Right? So what do we find for the internet? We find the average conservative lives in a neighborhood that is about 60% conservative. And the average liberal lives in a neighborhood that is about 53% conservative. That's roughly like the difference between a world where conservatives got all their news from USA Today and liberals got all their news from CNN. Kind of put that in. So you can think about how different are those sources uh, in terms of their extremity to us, and we talk about various ways to scale this magnitude. This seemed like a pretty small amount of segregation in absolute terms, pretty small differences. By comparison, racial segregation of US cities is something like 0.3, it's like way out here. How does that compare to other media? Well, these are the other media. Um, so the internet is indeed a bit more segregated than TV a bit less segregated than national newspapers. National newspapers are segregated because of the New York Times. It has a very liberal audience. These are all of your face-to-face -face interactions. So your family, your workplace, your neighborhood, people you say you trust, people you say you talk about politics with are all much more segregated than any media. And so the broad picture is, I think, the absolute level of echo chambers on the internet is low. It's similar to other traditional media, and it's much lower than people's face-to-face -face social networks. So media as a whole, including digital media, circa this paper, are a force pulling away from segregation, whereas the people people actually know are pulling in the opposite direction. Okay. Now keep in mind, as we start thinking about how new developments like Facebook might change this, Think about if you looked at this picture and said, I've got a good idea. Why don't we take all of people's news and information consumption and filter it through these social networks, through who your friends are? You might worry that that could be a dangerous thing to do from this perspective. And I think as I'll show you, the data support that. Yeah? 
Yeah, so, so the question is, is there any information on engagement or what people do, or it may be that even within these sites, in terms of the intensity of which things people look at, you could see more polarization. I think for now I'll just say we talk about that a lot in this paper, and we don't have perfect evidence. Our data really is at the domain level here, but we talk about weighting things differently by minutes, by pages viewed, and we present some evidence on the kind of within domain segregation, and I think our overall takeaway is the picture doesn't change dramatically. Yeah, so the question is, how, how does the exact timing with which people see different things impact that? I would agree. I think, I think here we just want to get an overall picture of what people are exposed to. But certainly another way, there are a bunch of ways, I guess, I guess what I said, the fact that people are not segregated here does not by any stretch mean, therefore, they end up with the same beliefs, they see the world the same way, and we're all one, one big happy family. We just showed you data that says that's not true. So I think there are a bunch of reasons why, even though a lot of people are getting news and information from the same places, they might nevertheless end up with very different beliefs, end up weighting things that they see differently, ending up trusting the different outlets they see differently. And the way the timing of things are presented could be a piece of that. Okay, so I told you there's a good theory for why we should see these echo chambers, potentially. And, and people have argued that. So, what is wrong with that theory? Why is it that we don't see more segregation? Well, as we talk about in this paper, there are kind of two key facts. The first is actually news and information consumption online is very concentrated in a small number of big sites. Something like the top four or five sites account for 50% of all visits. So those are things like CNN, ABC News, in this period, Yahoo News still to, to a significant extent. And so if, if like half of people are all going to those big sites that have representative audiences already, we can't be in echo chambers entirely. And then the other piece is, you might say, well, okay, fine, half of the people are just going to CNN.com and everybody that has a kind of representative audience, but what if there are 20% of people on either side who are in these echo chambers? That would still be a problem. The data show that that's not true either. Why is that not true either? It, it turns out that if you look at somebody, pick some really extreme site, like RushLimbaugh.com is one of the most extreme sites in these data. Pick a random person who visited RushLimbaugh.com yesterday. You can be sure that that person, one, is kind of a political junkie, and two, uses the internet a lot. Because people who are not political junkies and, don't, and use the internet a lot don't go to RushLimbaugh.com, as it turns out. And so that means that that person, yes, they went to some extreme sites, but they also went to CNN probably, and they also went to the New York Times probably. So to put that in perspective, a random person from Rush Limbaugh who visited RushLimbaugh.com yesterday is more likely to have read the New York Times yesterday than an average internet news user. A random person from the most liberal site in the data is more likely to have read Fox News yesterday than an average internet user. We do not think that is because these people visiting these websites have some kind of enlightened desire for alternative viewpoints. It's just they're on the internet a lot, looking at lots of political content, and so they bump into, into that kind of stuff. Um, so it's also not true that there are lots of people in the tails. Just one way to, one way to sort of think of that fact, think like a, an image that a lot of people might carry around is the typical Republican kind of gets their news from Fox News. And the typical Democrat gets their news from the New York Times. Okay. Either of those people would actually be very extreme in the distribution. So somebody who just got their news from Fox or things like Fox would be more conservative in their news diet than 99% of Americans, 95% of Americans. Somebody who just got their news and information from the New York Times heads up to some people in this room, as a more liberal news diet than 99% of Americans. So most people are clustered in the middle. Okay, so that was all about circa seven, eight years ago. What has changed since then? I think the big thing that has changed since then is the rise of social media. And so in that paper, we were making a pretty strong argument that, you know, the basic economics of digital news are a lot like the basic economics of other kinds of news. And although the form, the format has changed, 
the fundamental economic forces are, have not, and therefore the internet we should expect to look a lot like other media. I actually think that if you, if you think carefully about what social media does, it changes those funnel, fundamental economics in a couple of ways. One, as I said, is we're gonna mediate everything through these social networks that we know are very segregated. And two, the other thing I think is super important is just empirically, Facebook tends to dramatically downweight the importance of big famous brand name sources and dramatically increase the importance of smaller sources. So whereas that person I told you who is not a big political junkie or a heavy internet user and who therefore would never have thought to go navigate directly to RushLimbaugh.com has a pretty good chance of seeing RushLimbaugh.com show up in their Facebook feed. And when they do, empirically, they'll be pretty likely to click on it. Okay. So those, those are both reasons I think we, we should be potentially concerned. How big is it today? We don't have perfect evidence on this, but I think two data points. One, if you look within Facebook and try to measure the, the isolation index just the way I did there, there's a science paper by Lada Atomic and a number of other data scientists at Facebook that they don't present it that way, but they have the kind of data points that would let you do that. And, and the isolation index for Facebook looks remarkably similar to the isolation index I showed you for face-to-face -face networks. It's like up around 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. So it is much more segregated within Facebook. Now that's not such a big deal if that's still a small share of the total. And there's a paper that shows circa 2013 or so, it's still a small enough share that it doesn't really move the needle a lot, but it's growing over time, and so I think that's a reason for concern, okay? So we can come back and talk about, about those facts uh, a little bit in a sec. Let me just quickly give you the, the little story that we have on fake news per se in the 2016 election. So there was a lot of discussion, obviously, about these stories that circulated on Facebook. Hillary Clinton is running a child sex ring in a pizza parlor. The Pope endorsed Donald Trump for president, so on and so forth. And those things circulated widely. A lot of people suggested that uh, that might be the reason that Donald Trump is president, people seeing those false stories. Mark Zuckerberg, in his first interview about that, said that's crazy to think that those stories could have shaped the election. Here, too, we don't have any great instrument to tell you here's exactly the answer, but we're gonna try to bound things a little bit in between it's obvious that this swung the election and Mark Zuckerberg's it's crazy to think that it swung the election and get the sort of orders of magnitude straight. And so the main point of this paper is just to try to get a sense of um, if you looked at the average voter in the few months before the election, how many of these stories did they actually see? That's really what we're trying to do. So to do that, we use information from a few sources, online audience data like the Comscore data I was showing you before, fact-checking websites to build a database of all of the fake news stories that circulated before the election, and then a new online survey that we did which included that question about what's your most important source that I showed you before. Um, so you know, first thing you can see from these results is just we, we go out and collect all fake news stories that we can find which we define to be any story that is on one of a bunch of different fact-checking websites that those fact-checking websites have declared to be false. So that's our definition of a fake news story. How many of those can we find? Well, it turns out that there are 115 or so that favored Donald Trump, 45 or so that favored Hillary Clinton. The Donald Trump ones are shared relatively more. So pro-Trump fake news was shared about 30 million times and pro-Clinton fake news was shared about 8 million times or so. So, you know, that sounds like a lot. Clearly, it supports the view that what fake news there was was tilted in favor of Trump. Question, what does this translate into, into how many stories the average voter actually saw? And how persuasive would these stories have to have been in order for that to have swung the election? Keeping in mind that to swing the election, all you really needed to do was change Wisconsin and Michigan, places where the vote share was pretty small. Okay, so we have, we have kind of three ways to measure 
exposure, none of which is perfect, but which we think kind of triangulate, you can get a sense. So one is just, we know how many times these things were shared on Facebook. And in prior literature and marketing and other places, people have been concerned with the question, what on average is the ratio of shares to clicks, shares to reads, just for, for various kinds of content. And so, you know, none of those are political fake news, so none of them are perfect matches, but roughly speaking, if you look across those things, a high number would be 20 reads per share. So we could use that as a benchmark. If you, if you assume that each of these fake news stories was read, like clicked through and read 20 times for every time it was shared, that would imply three fake news stories per voter in the three months to the election. The, the voter would have, average voter read three of these stories. Method two, take the list of sites that we have that host fake news, go to the Comscore data, figure out how many visitors they had and add that up. That would imply 1.9 fake news stories per voter. And method three is use our survey. So what did we do in our survey? We took a bunch of fake news stories. We asked people, do you remember hearing or reading anything about the Pope endorsing Donald Trump in the three months before the election? And we asked that for a bunch of different stories. Now, an issue you have to worry about when you do that is on surveys like that, you could ask people about basically anything and some share of people will say, ah, oh, yeah, I remember, I remember reading that, either because they think they do or because they're moving through the survey quickly. So what we also did was we included a bunch of what we called placebo stories, which are similar kind of stories that we just made up. We call them fake, fake stories. <laughs> and so those nobody actually saw before the election, but the share of people who say, oh, yeah, I remember reading that, gives us kind of a benchmark for this placebo effect, and we can use the difference between the two, just like you would in a clinical trial, to get an estimate. And if you do that, you get about one fake news story per voter. So I think, I think the right takeaway is the average voter saw something like one, three, five, not 10, 30, 50 of these stories in the run-up of the election. Now, could that have changed the election outcome? We don't know. It all depends on one crucial missing parameter, which is, how much does seeing one of these stories change the way you vote? So we don't know that number. Nobody knows that number. But what we can do is just kind of benchmark it. So there's something we do know about, which is what is the impact of seeing a television commercial on how you vote? That's something people have estimated, like the impact of political ads on voting. So you could ask, in units of political ads, how persuasive would these stories have needed to be to shift the election outcome? And depending on which number you use, that is something like 20 or 30. So one fake news story would need to be like 20, 30 political ads and its impact to have changed the election outcome. So I can leave it to you to think, is that plausible? Is it not plausible? Sounds like a big number. Sounded to us like a big number. On the other hand, if somebody actually believes that Hillary Clinton is running a child sex ring in a pizza parlor, that probably should affect their vote to a large degree, so it might be plausible that these things have these big impacts. So we think that's just kind of helpful bounding these things. So let me wrap up and then take 10 minutes or so to take questions. I think bottom line, your perception that polarization is increasing and is high, I think it's correct, despite some squabbling in the academic literature about exactly how to define that. Digital media are increasingly important, and I think in particular social media is something that has fundamentals about its economics that should make us worried, but it is not so far, I think, the driving force behind the polarization that we're seeing. As a final note, what might be the driving force? I'd throw out three things to think about. The first, as I already mentioned, is cable TV. We have actually very good natural experiment kind of evidence from a couple of recent papers showing that Fox News, MSNBC, partisan cable, has a big impact on how people vote and could plausibly explain quite a bit of rising polarization. And that's consistent, unlike social media, with the demographic patterns that I showed you. A second thing is, you know, politicians respond to voters, but politicians also affect voters. And there are a number of reasons unrelated to the voters that partly explain, I think, why politicians have become more polarized over time. And if the pol politicians are becoming extreme, and we have people running for president saying really extreme things and saying really nasty, mean things about the other side, that could drive polarization 
among voters. And finally, and maybe most importantly, I think actually a lot of what's going on right now is not about media, is not about political rhetoric and campaigns, is about deeper things about the experiences of people living in this country, like income inequality, differences in outcomes, differences in, in, in what people are facing in different parts of this country where they're actually living very different experiences. So I think those things are important too. Okay. I had a question about bias among the fake news debunking sites themselves. It seems like it's such a huge difference. Um, did you guys take into account at all whether the fake news debunking sites had some sort of bias in that? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great question. The, the basic answer is no, we don't have any way to say. We're, we're trying to not get into arbitrating, was it fair or not fair to call any particular story fake. I think, I think we, the, the statement we want to make is just of the stuff that was shown on these, on these fact-checking websites, a large majority favored Trump. But is it possible that there were a bunch of fake news stories favoring Clinton, which those sites declared to be true even though they were really false? That's possible. And we don't, we don't have a way to, to arbitrate that. Yeah. You interpreted the uh, spatial segregation as sort of uh, beliefs causing uh, the segregation. I'm wondering if there's a reverse interpretation. You choose where you live for reasons mostly unrelated to the political beliefs of uh, people living there, but you become friends with the people living there, and maybe those friends influence your political beliefs. Yeah, so, so remember what I said is the notion that residential segregation by politics, that is conservatives living physically around other conservatives and liberals living physically around other liberals, is something people have argued has been going up, but I think the overall preponderance of the evidence suggests is not going up. So that's not something that, that we argue has been going up, and I think a way to think about why the facts in that Bill Bishop book are, are difficult to interpret is what, what Bill Bishop shows is the, the share of counties in the US where the vote shares in the presidential election are extreme, either landslide Republican or landslide Democrat, has gone up over time. There are two ways that that could happen. One is the people running for president have stayed the same, but the voters have moved around. So now all the Republicans live in one place and all the Democrats live in the other place. The other thing that could happen is the voters stay exactly where they are and their views stay exactly the same, but the people running for president have gotten more extreme over time. That would lead to exactly the same prediction. You have some county where the candidates used to be kind of close and so 60-40, we sort of disagree. As the candidates move farther apart, that county is gonna shift to voting all Republican or all Democrat. And so it's hard, and we have a lot of evidence that the candidates have been getting more extreme over time. So I think it's hard to know from that kind of voting data. So in the social media stuff with the, the breaking it out by age, you talked about how that didn't seem to be a huge driver of the, of the election. Um, is it possible that that kind of mediated differences in age where without social media, the differences would have been even bigger and that might have kind of be a, a masked kind of cause of the election a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think if you thought, so I guess first thing to say is, you should not by any means take those facts to imply that the effect of social media is zero. I don't say that at all. If the effect of social media is not zero and social media is used mostly by young people, then in a world without social media, the gap in polarization between old and young would have been bigger. And so I think, I think absolutely that's true. And, and again, coming back to this media story, I think if I had to guess what's going on with the media side of things, it's that cable TV is a very strong polarizing force. Social media is also, to some extent, a polarizing force. And that's caused big increases among the older people who watch TV and smaller increases among younger people who use social media. And if you took away social media, that might have been, that might have been less. Yeah. So in, in terms of uh, trying to estimate the effect of social media, um, is there some reason, so, so psychologically, I would, I would imagine there is actually a reason to believe that where I get the source, so where I get the article impacts me. So if I'm getting it from a trusted source on Facebook versus just on CNN.com, those should not have the same persuasiveness. I mean, is, there, is that something that can be incorporated into it? I think, yeah, I think it's super important and I don't, we don't have measures, good measures of it yet. I think 
the idea of people attaching credibility to sources and that having a big impact on how they update is, is a super important thing about the way media and information markets work going way back in time forever. So how do you make money running a newspaper in 1890 or running a TV station in 1970 or running a website in 2008? The way you make money is by building a reputation for being a high quality source, whatever that means to people. Trustworthy, reliable, entertaining. And, and, and that brand capital of media outlets is a key part of what those markets do. And to the extent that quality is associated with reliability and trust, that gives those outlets a strong incentive to try to get things right. To what extent what Facebook is doing is de-emphasizing those sources, and people don't see sources so much on Facebook, that dramatically weakens that incentive for the media outlets. And so it's possible that sources matter a ton on Facebook. I think the evidence, such as it is, suggests that people pay a lot less attention to sources in what they click on on Facebook. There are some experiments that show you know, people click on news and then you ask them afterwards, hey, by the way, do you remember where that thing you clicked on came from? And people don't know. Um, and so I, th I think it's, it's an empirical question how much it's true, but to the extent that Facebook is something like an anonymous browsing environment where it doesn't matter where it came from, that's a hugely important fact. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, first off. Um, my question is to do with um, partisan language. I was just curious, um, when you're talking about language, was, is this in terms of like word choice, or does this also get at, like does the algorithm or the machine learning also get at things like um, addressivity in terms of the kinds of like me, you, we, them, yeah. you know, like that kind of thing? Yeah, 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 great. Yeah, so that question. was the first part, and then the second part was whether or not you can see um, those same sorts of like partisan language, for example, in the ways that Facebook stories are shared. So when people frame those stories, can you see uptake? Or for example, when people are commenting on online news stories, is there, can you also, could you also apply that sort of machine learning technique to look at comments? Great, so first on the, on the study we did on partisan language in Congress, um, we're, we're doing something which is kind of standard in the text analysis literature, which is we boil everything down to counts of phrases. So it, it, it incorporates a little more dependence in the language than just individual words. Death tax is something different from just saying death or saying tax. But we're not using any more, any richer features of language beyond that. There is a whole world of natural language processing algorithms that in principle let you do that. And I think going beyond those word counts to get it or people fighting more um, would be great. I also think applying, so uh, you know, a couple of things you suggest I totally agree would be great. And we're, we'd love to find ways to do these or for other people to do these. One is look at the content people post on Facebook or just more generally look at language of ordinary people and see how that's changing. I, we, part of the reason we care about Congress language. You might say, who cares about how people talk in Congress? They're in the Congress talking to each other. Like That doesn't matter for anything. Part of why we care is because there is evidence that that language filters out into the media, filters out into the way we all talk about politics. And I think looking at that in more detail would be great. And looking at sharing patterns on Facebook too, um, I think would be great. Part of the challenge is right now, a lot of the data you need to do that is inside Facebook. And they, you know, they're trying to figure all this stuff out. They're in principle, I think, pretty open to doing research. But this set of topics is super sensitive for them right now. So anything that kind of gets near political polarization is too risky for them to do kind of publicly facing research about. Yeah. yeah. So I was wondering how you think about um, the ways that the incentives of social media, uh, that social media creates for um, sort of uh, media publications, specifically that, um, so the one study showed that like, um, used moral foundations theory to study the extent to which like different publications use moral values from their like political ideology. Another study, and I can't remember the name of this one, um, talked about uh, uh, partisan clicking, that on social media people tend to click much more on content that is clearly partisan uh, towards, towards their belief. I was wondering, given that like media, like the barrier between news and opinion has changed, a number of factors have changed for a lot of publications, how do you think about the way that social media affects the incentives around the way publications write content. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, and I, I wanna know, because I think it's super, I think it's very important. 
how, if you imagine the New York Times incentives or CNN's incentives or Fox News incentives in a world where what they're trying to do is build up a long-term base of subscribers versus what they're trying to do is get clicks on Facebook. How are those two things different? Does it push you toward, do you get relatively more clicks through more partisan content? Do you get relatively more clicks through different kinds of you know, less hard news and, and more entertainment celebrity kind of stories? Does it matter less whether it's accurate? Um, I don't think we know yet, and I think it's a very uh, important thing to learn. Yeah. Maybe two more questions? Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering about the mechanism by which cable TV could possibly uh, create this polarization or increase it. It seems like most people get basically the same set of major channels. So is this a matter of people literally flipping to different channels, or are people seeing the same thing but interpreting it in different ways? Or, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you should have caught a potential conflict in, as you did in what I just said, which is I showed you cable TV is not actually that segregated in who watches what. If you remember the cable TV little dots on my figure, they're pretty far to the left. So conservatives watch more Fox News, liberals watch more CNN and MSNBC, but those differences are not enormous. It's maybe like two-thirds, one-third kind of differences. Um, and so if we said, eh, people are actually seeing a lot of the same content, and yet this is this huge polarizing force, how is that true? I, I think the takeaway is the impact of cable TV and other media, possibly with the exception of social media, is not coming through exposure, but it's coming through how people interpret or how they weight what they see. And if you want to see big differences, the question is not to ask is not, do you, have, do you look at Fox News or do you look at MSNBC? but do you trust Fox News or do you trust MSNBC? And there it's like 95-5, you know, 90-10 kind of number. And so I, th I, think, I think a lot of the stuff here, and this relates to what we were saying about sources and building up reputations for reliability. I think trust is a crucial part of this whole equation. The kind of crisis of credibility and trust that we see right now for a lot of people in mainstream media, the question of how do people decide what to trust when do we agree to sort of trust the same thing versus we end up totally disagreeing about that? Those are, those are all super important. Okay, last question. Um, so it seems like the rise of these new like hyperpartisan sites like you know Breitbart might end up kind of increasing the credibility of sites like Fox News, for example. And I was wondering, you know, it seems like that could be both you know a symptom and also a cause of like this polarization that we're observing. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yep. Yeah. So. So one, in thinking about trust, if you used to be the most extreme thing in the world and then somebody comes along that's even more extreme, could that bolster your credibility? I think absolutely. Two, could the fact that Breitbart has gone from being a kind of fringe, obscure, very small thing to a pretty big thing, could that matter? I think absolutely. I mean, all that is scaled by how important is the internet, how important is social media. So for that big chunk of people who mostly get their news from TV, Breitbart is not changing things. But absolutely could be an important force. I mean, I, I, you know, related to that, I think if, there's, if I had to pick one thing that would potentially improve things in the media landscape, I would say we need more conservative news outlets. And more conservative, I would even take more conservative news outlets about like Fox. If they were a little bit more moderate than Fox, that would be even better. But if, you know, forget about like difficult questions about what does neutral mean and what's biased and what's unbiased. If you just look at things based on their audiences or based on what people say they trust, there is an incredible imbalance where a, the overwhelming majority of media outlets both are watched by, read by, trusted by people who voted for Hillary Clinton for the most part. And the other side of that product space is very sparse and has basically one big remotely, you know, we could argue, but let's call Fox News high quality, high quality outlet in it. And that leaves room for stuff that, you know, you might think of as pretty fringy and extreme to get a lot of market share. So I, I kind of like competition and I think the lack of competition in that conservative space and the fact that the competition's all like, competition for who can be the most extreme is damaging. And you'd think there might be a pretty big market opportunity for 
sensible, in some sense, conservative news. Okay, thank you all very much.